So welcome, Esra. Um, I will give a quick introduction on Esra. Um, and I should caveat that like, I feel very um, non-objective in speaking with uh, Esra. She is one of the dearest people in the world to me. I met her uh, 10 years ago um, through a project at Google. And um, I can't imagine my life without her in it. Um, so thank you so much, Esra, first of all, for joining. We're uh, really lucky uh, to, to even have this time to chat with you because we know how busy you are. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Amazing. Okay, so a quick bio on Estra. So Estra Al Shafi is uh, from Bahrain. She is a founder and executive director of Majal.org, and she is a human rights activist, as well as uh, the founder of a network of digital platforms that amplifies underreported and marginalized voices from around the world. Uh, she has a team spread around the world, and they build digital projects that creatively help to facilitate the struggle for social justice in the Middle East, North Africa, and I would argue beyond. Um, she has an incredible list of accolades um, and she is involved with organizations around the world and she's currently at the MIT Media Lab as a director's fellow. Uh, for me she is somebody who embodies courage and vision and has always been ahead of most people in the tech space uh, in thinking about uh, activism uh, you know despite the fact that she's not she's rarely lived in the US or in Silicon Valley. So thank you for joining us, Esra. And I really wanted to start with, uh, you know, what Olivia just referenced is this moment of time. Um, how, how are you doing? How has it affected your work to be, to go through lockdown, to go through this pandemic? Uh, you're far away from home uh, or your many homes uh, and to be thinking about uh, social justice in, at a time where uh, there is so much uh, upheaval, uh, both online and in the physical world around us? And how are you addressing that right now? Yeah, I mean, the the first thing was in the very beginning, it wasn't, it didn't feel like it was disrupting our work so much in the sense that we were all very used to working remotely already. So for more than 15 years, my team and I have been working remotely. And one of the main reasons of that is that, you know, visa issues, border issues, lack of resources, uh, meant that we we were we never really had the privilege of working together or meeting together or even strategizing in person. Um, we never had the ability to do you know um, team retreats and 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 things that many organizations I think have maybe taken for granted for so long because we do we do see so many nonprofits um, do that even though they work many many times you know in in their own um, offices and things like that. So working from home came naturally to all of us. I mean, for, for us, that was not a, dis a distraction in any way. Um, but the uncertainty was problematic for sure. The uncertainty of resources, the uncertainty of human life, the uncertainty of our health, um, the health of the, the world, um, our person, you know, our families, and also the fact that for the longest time, I mean, I have consistently been on the road in order to fundraise, in order to connect with others on the things that we build. That's primarily how we ended up collaborating with so many organizations around the world, Latin America, India, Pakistan. Um, and that's as a result is, you know, of these types of conferences and events and networks that we now have to find another way to kind of get access to those types of resources, um, you know, because foundations don't know about the work of Majal. And then of course we deal with some of the most marginalized communities in our region, migrant workers, LGBTQ communities, women, um, and all of them have been so incredibly impacted by this pandemic, whether it's the inability to go out and find resources, the inability to go out and find access to legal support, therapy, um, just, you know, connections and, you know, in-person support groups that that has robbed people of, of the much needed support that they need, you know, in order to just get by. And um, of course, with migrant workers, when it comes to the fact that, you know, the governments have not been prioritizing their health and safety, that they, you know, they already live in deplorable conditions across labor camps in the country um, or, or throughout the Gulf. And, you um, if anything, the pandemic has just worsened the situation. And as a result of many companies not getting, um, you know, losing a lot of money, they have been the first to really um, experience the, um, the, the extreme poverty 
that can result from a pandemic of this kind when everything shuts down and they get no pay but expected to, to work even more hours than they were before. I mean, it has showed us as a side of injustice that even before we were not, you know, um, a lot of people were not capable of believing that something like this could happen under our noses and in our backyards. So that's in a nutshell, you know, how things have been um, going for us. Just a lot of anxiety and nervousness about, you know, the state of the, the, the world today and how we will cope in the future. And you've been connecting and working across all of these things. I think Majal was one of the starting platforms, but do they all come under the umbrella of that now? Or Yes, absolutely. You have, you've got so many different projects that you've set up in 10 years. It's amazing. Um, but for our listeners who maybe don't know your work yet, um, it, which is incredible but could you just sort of explain a little bit what it is that how these things sort of slot together um or connect yeah absolutely so in bahrain um around 14 or 15 years ago um i founded an um an organization and at the time it was actually called mid-east youth and the idea was that it was going to be a platform um, this was, you know, before Twitter, before Facebook was, you know, um, in the region. So we didn't really have a lot of challenge to kind of express uh, um, channels to express our, ourselves. And so, um, but living in a place where where surveillance and censorship was the norm, where injustices were gone without, you know, any accountability whatsoever, um, where people were witnessing abuses on a daily basis, but didn't know where to go to kind of talk about it or amplify these voices. Um, that's where the idea of Midi Youth came about because I started using the internet in my teens, um, in my mid teens, and I realized that this was going to be the weapon with which we could fight for um, freedom of expression. And so, but everywhere I went online, I felt that there were a lot of people who were not really discussing these very openly. And most importantly, they were not doing it in a collective way. So Midi Youth was founded as sort of a group block at the time where we do podcast and video and talk about all the issues that we felt were not being discussed um, in our societies. And over time, you know, we had three languages in Farsi, Arabic, and English. And over time, we had, you know, over 900 authors from around the region kind of contributing on a daily basis about all of these different issues. And from that came the urge to kind of um, create different channels to talk about certain things in a very specific way, like laser focusing on some of the ethnic and religious minority issues like Kurdish rights or the rights of the Baha'i community, migrant rights. Um, so we kind of offshooted and, you know, we had tons of platforms, Baha'irights.org, KurdishRights.org, MigrantRights.org, um, where people wanted to go and find documentation about these specific um, issues. And migrant rights kind of took on a life of its own after that. It became and remains today the primary resource for information about migrant workers in the Gulf region. So oftentimes, even if you see the Washington Post, New York Times, The Guardian, when they do talk about this issue, more often than not, you, you do see you know links to migrant rights because we have on the ground researchers who actually go um, to the labor camps in person, they go to the ministries in person, they find information that is otherwise unavailable. Um, and then, you know, one other example is MIDI students because we realized that there was a lot of musicians who use music as a tool for social justice advocacy, but didn't have a platform um, because, you know, there's um, tools like Anrami, for example, which is sort of the regional version of Spotify that actually does not allow social and political content. So where does this, um, where does this information live? At the time, they were all in across MySpace and you know, um, uh, uh, you know, different um, streaming platforms that people didn't really know about. People couldn't find this information, and even in Bahrain, for example, people were shocked at the number of bands and artists that we had. And so, this is an example, you know, where we really wanted to um, ensure that people had access to this type of information because it is the impact musicians have in a region is huge. So we wanted to make sure that this was completely amplified. So we built a mobile app, you know, browser applications, desktop applications, and people started writing and saying, wow, we're really inspired, you know, by this Kurdish artist. We had no idea that Kurds were this, you know, uh, struggling so much. And we realized that when we had started these platforms and just were writing about these issues, we had some audiences, but for the most part, we were speaking to the choir, you know, people who were already um, under, who already understood and were on board about why these issues were a problem. Um, but Midi students gave us the ability to completely widen 
you know, our audience. And we started, you know, seeing so many young people who otherwise would not be on a platform about social justice, talk about gender equality, talk about LGBTQ rights, because they were inspired so much by the music that they were listening to. So that, so we felt that we were kind of bringing on board a lot more people than we would have if it was just an article, you know, or just a long, you know, um, expose about something. Because people, you know, we tend to run away from a lot of these issues because we live it every single day. And it's depressing and it brings a lot of anxiety. And when we come online, often we want an escape. But here you're listening to music and the escape, you are escaping, but you're at the same time, you're, bring, you're, you're being true to yourself and to your values and um, to what you stand for by listening and you know bringing in um, that type of inspiration. I mean, it's incredible that you start, you've been able to be flexible and iterative with these different platforms. You've been able to go in different directions and to find audiences. And I know that you also are able to run these platforms quite separately. How do you personally go, and I wanna talk more about Midi's tunes in a second, but how do you bring your head, you know, as sort of the, you're the director of this organization, it spans, um, everything from migrant rights to LGBTQ rights uh, in in countries where, you know, I think the LGBT community is perhaps the most exposed and vulnerable in the world, uh, to thinking about music as activism. How do you reset your own thoughts um, from one platform to another? And also uh, there's an audience, you have the stakeholders, but equally you have the technology and you're constantly designing a technology that serves different needs. I'd just love to understand how you think about the product and how you shift kind of your own, you know, day to day uh, in navigating this, because that for me feels as somebody who works in tech, a, like a very difficult thing to be constantly doing, given also the overlying emotional aspect of each of these. Absolutely. And I won't lie that it's overwhelming, but the way that I deal with it is that I have specific days for specific platforms. And so it would be Monday and Wednesday, I only do Ahwa, you know, Tuesday and Thursday, only Midi Stooms, Friday, you know, um, and throughout the weekend, I would do Mike and Rights. Um, and the, the most important thing is surrounding myself with a team that fully understands how to operate in this way as well. So that when on the Monday that I'm on Ahwa, they're on Midi Stunes. And so every day there the platform does have somebody who's kind of keeping an eye on it. And sometimes it's knowing when to walk away from a platform, like Crad Voice, for example. It was after, you know, almost a decade we had to um, put it in archive mode and now it's sort of been taken over by the internet archive. But Crad Voice is, you know, one of the um platforms can that say, we built. can you say what it is? What 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 was sure. Crad Voice? So Crowdforce was founded in 2009, and the idea was that it was, you know, we, it was a, um, a platform where we curate and contextualize information about social justice movements around the world. And so in this, um, in this platform, you know, we had a, a big issue where journalists were not able to access a lot of data from specific places due to internet lockdowns and shutdowns and media blackouts. Um, and so with all the information that was online, it was kind of completely scattered across different hashtags, different um, languages. Um, people who were uploading information to YouTube did it without any met metadata, you know, to add context to what these were. So a lot of information were kind of disappearing you know people and journalists were accessing maybe 20 to 30 percent of the content that was available online but there was so much more that people were not aware of um so we built an algorithm that kind of went through and collected all this information um but um enabled people to kind of moderate it and so when people come you know it dealt with um, verification issues somebody says oh this protest actually took place in bahrain not yemen this you know um this incident took place in, you know, Saudi Arabia, things like that. And so people had the ability to moderate, people had the ability to add information, but you also had the ability to aggregate information from live feeds or hashtags and things like that. Um, and it able, it, it would, you know, we had the capability of doing this at scale. So we, at some pages, we're collecting, you know, hundreds of thousands of pieces of videos, for example, if the protest was very widespread. And then we had teams of dozens of thousands of moderators, volunteers that kind of come through and say, you know, this is correct, this is not, this is, you know, um, old, and this is, um, and so for the first couple of years, it was actually very widely used by, you know, uh, Al Jazeera, it was linked from The Guardian, UN Dispatch, I mean, a lot of people were kind of using it as a resource to get access to what, you know, otherwise would be completely 
difficult, especially at that time, 2009, again, you know, in 2010, Twitter and Facebook, it was very difficult to find access to this, um, to this type of information. Um, and so, so crowd voice survived for a very long time. And then the internet, the shape of the world kind of changed, technologies changed, and we felt the need wasn't as big as it was today. And it was also took a lot of resources. I mean, we were paying thousands of dollars in hosting per month because we were hosting tons of information from around the world. Um, and then we also added layers of infographics. For example, when someone sees a bunch of videos of protests, it doesn't mean anything to them, you know? But if you really see, oh, this problem actually goes back way, you know, in 1984, when this policy was passed by this specific government, this is how you start piecing together. Why are people on the street? And since how long has this issue been going on? Rather mm -hmm. than, oh, people are just on the street and everything's gonna be fine in a couple of days. It, it enabled, it encouraged a lot of people who sat on the fence to realize no, this is actually an ongoing problem. This is not just a little issue. Um, I mean, for me, crowd voice really encapsulates that, you know, we look back on this time, maybe we call it the Arab Spring, maybe we call it something else, but this moment in history where we redefined how we could use the internet to have a voice. And I think it's really easy to forget that that wasn't very long ago and crowd voice was so much at the center of it. I, you know, and, and I wonder in terms of also letting it go and shutting it down, how that felt, because for me, it also really defined a lot of the work of Majal. Um, you know, how, how did you find that challenging or did you just know? I was in complete denial for the for several years that we had to shut it down. So I was keeping it up. I was, you know, we were I was doing consulting work on the side just to make sure I could pay off the server fees. I mean, it was very emotional to let go of something like that, because also it was not something that could get much funding. And unfortunately, it was not due to the fact that it didn't work. That was as a result of the fact that technology from the global south simply doesn't get recognition and doesn't get funded. So if this was maybe founded in California or Berlin, um, it might have gotten some support, you know, because they see it as, oh, this is technology that could work and we could. But when it comes from the global south, we have this lack of trust. Um, mm -hmm. In, in the sense that they, you know, funders don't really trust that you can build really good technology from the global south, from our own perspective, and really address the needs of on the ground advocates, um, which was us. I mean, in many ways, we were our own target audience. In fact, Crowdvoice was supposed to be an internal project to streamline the information that we were getting on migrant rights, for example, and, you know, the, and um, these types of um, causes that we were working on. And then it became this much bigger thing, but it was so emotional, you know, and, and, and even with the team, I mean, you work on something for a decade, you know, and you build it and you have these big dreams about it and all of the lives it can take and the, um, you know, the directions it can take, um, but it, it didn't work in that way. And that was primarily due to lack of resources. Um, and that made me sad for other reasons as well. It made me sad for the sense that how come there are so many other tools out there that are nowhere near as advanced and they're getting millions and we barely could get, you know, 10, 20,000 for something like this. So um, it did make me, um, you know, when I, I also started a podcast um, and it's called Philanthropist. And in it, I talk a lot about the um, lack of equity when it comes to philanthropy and when it comes to access to fundraising and, and um, funding and things like that, we simply don't have any access to these avenues to get support for these types of projects, regardless of the amount of impact that they have. And so, you know. How much is that changing right now? I mean, I know there's like the rest of the world newsletter. There's obviously uh, a rise of investors coming out of China and Southeast Asia. Do you think it's changing at all right now in this kind of current contemporary moment? Very slowly and very rarely. There are very few, you know, funders, foundations who kind of see this and understand, you know, what, what. Um, but even access to them is very difficult. You know, mm -hmm. for them, they, they would say, we want to fund very specific things and very specific people. And they would often continue funding the same, you know, usual suspects over and over again, rather than say, I want to take a risk and I want to, um, expand and I want to, you know, start funding other projects. Um, so it definitely remains a really major, major problem. We, we simply, we don't have the avenues. Um, we don't have that type of availability for the support. Um, 
And you often need to know the right people. Even if you're a woman of color, you're, you know, you're from the global south, you need to know the right powerful people. I was lucky enough to know because I've been in this, you know, more than 15 years now. But for those who are just starting out, it's an it's an incredibly difficult and uphill battle for them. So mm -hmm. it's changing, but it's not changing enough. And it's not changing fast enough. And as a result, we see a lot of platforms online that are managed by white men, for example, and who don't take voices like ours into account when they design and build these products. And it's the same thing for nonprofit tech, for example. You see change.org, how much funding do they have access to versus mm -hmm. a much you know, um, more impactful organization in the Middle Eastern context, for example. What I was wondering is in terms of then kind of that heartbreak of walking away from a project that you've put so much time and energy and thought and care into um, to then sort of starting up your next projects and now being working on something like Mideast Tunes. How did you go about growing this other platform in a new space that's become um, a sort of a, an online stage for musicians to sort of come and share um, their music, music and their stories and all of that? And how is how is that going as a space and where do you want it to go and how is fundraising going for it and all of that? Yeah, I mean, interestingly enough, MIDI Students was launched pretty much the same time as Crowd Voice, but they all went in different directions. MIDI Students was completely self-sustaining in the sense that artists were signing up, you know, and we had a lot of people that were coming in and wanting to volunteer and support and bring in, recruit more bands and recruit, you know, artists and, for me, I was just kind of managing the back end, the back end, you know, making sure that everything um, was working, and the design was up and running. Um, but it took resources, you know, and and we didn't have that. So our first grant for MIDI students actually came through the Arab Fund for Arts and Culture all the way back in 2014, and that to this date was the pretty much the only funding that we got. So you can so and and MIDI students started off basically as a platform for activist music from around the Middle East, North Africa, but now it's expanded, right? Like it's a sort of any oh, yeah. musician from around the world. Um, and it's still, it's an online platform and there's an app. Yeah, so it's still um, any musicians from the Middle East and North Africa specifically, but you can, you don't really have to be a, a political musician. You can also kind of join in and, you know, sing about whatever it is that you want, because even for the, the you know, for example, if you're a Kurdish artist, just singing in your native tongue, that in and of itself is actually a political act. So you don't have to come and you know express a, a, a political opinion through this music. Sometimes just by existing, you know, sometimes just by being an LGBTQ singer, just by being a singer who happens to be a member of Baha'i faith in um, Iran, a singer who happens to be Kurdish in Turkey or in Syria or Iraq, you know, or so. For me, it's also a, it's a, an expression of the diversity of the region. And you can see there's so many different languages, so many different dialects, so many different instruments that are celebrated, you know, and people try to modernize it and bring it into, you know, marrying hip hop with very traditional poetry, for example. Um, and you can see how creative it is. So we opened it up, even we have some who are just spoken word, for example. You know, people really appreciate that there's so much creativity coming from the region and Midi Students amplifies that in a much wider stage. And in fact, but it's being used around the world. For example, Peter Gabriel uses it to recruit, um, you know, diverse artists for his um, events. We have a lot of um, um, media interests, BBC Radio, NPR, you know, that come and they want to feature musicians so they come to us and they say look we have a segment about kurdish refugees um do you have a song that or you know an artist who would be a very good fit for this and of course we always connect them with the artist because that's really good visibility for them and that's something that they need and so um that's really the role that you know midi students um continues to play mm. and i imagine has it continued to grow over time what are the metrics looking like in terms of engagement yeah. and how many people use it as a platform and how so many in terms of streamers, you know, more than 450,000. Um, and then we have, um, it's about 13,000 um, different, you know, originally produced tracks and about, um, you know, um, 2,400 or so artists overall who have joined up. And some of them are really have become stars, right? And some of them Absolutely. started... Who uh, can you give some examples? Because I mean, I, I know there's some that are like incredibly famous now and started off with this as their platform. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think of, um, you know, there's smoldering and forgotten, for example, that's a metal band in Bahrain. Um, there's Justina in, in Iran, for example, she's a hip hop artist. So there's definitely so many different stars and they have um, um, revolution makers, they're hip hop, you know, stars. And in fact, they actually started collaborating with the, um, the uh, uh, Universal Hip Hop Museum in the Bronx, for example. Oh, really? Because they approached us with a lot of interest because they see the amount of hip hop that we have in the region. And of course they want to figure out a way to collaborate. And so one way to do that was to kind of connect them with the with the local um, hip hop artists. So you can see that it definitely creates a lot of collaboration opportunities. And some of these stars, you know, have, have gotten much bigger as a result of that added visibility and, and touring with Peter Gabriel, you know, and doing all of these different things that they, they otherwise, I think, um, would be difficult for them to have access to because they don't have time also to do the marketing on their own or they have to hire somebody to do it or they have to pay for ads. Um, but when they join MIDI students, we do the marketing for them. I feel, so one of the things that you know, I really wanted to ask you about is this, you know, we're at this somehow more than ever a deeply political moment of time all over the world, not just in the countries that we come from. And it feels as though we're going down this one path where we're constantly talking about social justice and activism, and yet we're not engaging enough with culture and with art in this space. And that's what Midi's Tunes does. Do you see this expanding as, you know, you know you're in the US right now, do you see culture, uh, you know, becoming a stronger force for telling stories, for being political. Um, I'm curious about you because you're coming from a very political space uh, and, and I don't really see, you know, we've talked about this in the past when you go for funding and you say, I want to raise money, people are really happy uh, to support migrant rights or um, to think about LGBTQ rights in the Middle East. But when we go with music, uh, it's harder to make that connection for grants, for funding, for foundations. It's almost like a gap. Do you think that's going to change? And, and how do you think is a way to change that and to change the way this is perceived? Because for me, there's nothing more powerful. We trust artists. We trust you know, people who speak truth to power uh, with no agenda. And somehow those kinds of platforms don't seem to be receiving funding or support uh, from the way foundations are currently set up. Yeah, I mean, it has definitely been a major challenge trying to get this idea across because some foundations, they get it, but they say, oh, you know, it's not within our thematic focus areas at the, at the time, so we won't really support it. Um, Do you think it's because music is in a way a celebration of, of strength and not kind of a complaint, if that makes sense? Is that the issue? Yeah, you know, it could be, it, it could be, but at the same time, we do have a lot of artists, for example, who have been arrested and who have, and that shows their power and their impact. So even when it, or, you know, people who get death threats simply because they're, they're a women hip hop artist and they get death threats for it and they get trolled and there's so much harassment that happens, you know? So um, it, it does show that th this has so much impact. But at the same time, it's very difficult to articulate why this is important. And even if you do end up articulating it, a lot of foundations say, but it's not really social justice work. I mean, this is entertainment. So many times funders have dismissed MIDI students as this is just entertainment. You're just trying to build the Spotify of the region, or you should try and get venture capital. But we can't. We actually have tried taking that route. Mm -hmm. And when we try to monetize it, that's when things start getting corrupted the message gets corrupted in that way and it becomes about money and greed and it becomes something that it shouldn't be about um i'm not saying that people shouldn't because we we do think it's very important for platforms to be very self-sustaining in that way but at the same time you know it's very difficult to build something like this and to have it be for social justice and then you monetize it and also how do you do it when you are working in countries that are sanctioned, you know, you're talking about Iran, Libya, Syria, Palestine. How do you even get if, if people are able to get funding through this platform, which is our dream, because people do want to support them? How do we actually get the money there? So when funders tell us, oh, this should be a business and we tell them this is everything we tried. Only then are they able to, you know, and, and usually they don't even listen. You know, you have 15, 20 minute meetings with these individuals and then you don't have time to go into the depth of this is what happened and this is what we tried. They're just not, there's no interest to really listen. 
Um, so I don't know if that will actually change because I think a lot of people think that this is something that you can just make money off of because it's entertainment and it's business. But when it comes to mic and rights, of course, you can't monetize that. Mm -hmm. So there they see, oh, this is a humanitarian issue. You know, this is a human rights issue. So then you can get a grant for that. But they don't really see this. They also don't see this, that this is anti-censorship work. Mm -hmm. You know, when blog posts and the written word and, and um, they're being censored, music is harder to censor and it's easier to become more widespread. You know, you share it through WhatsApp, you share it through Telegram, you share it through Signal. You know, music is kind of just, it's going all over and people are keen. They're more, they, they want, they seek that information out. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's actually the one platform that is least censored. You know, Ahua is censored in many places. Crowdvoice was censored in at least four different countries. Um, you know, but Midi Students, not the same. Migrant Rights, have, you know, was censored in several countries in the Gulf in the past. Um, but Midi Students censored so far, you know, in Iran. And people are so used to censorship there that they know how to bypass it you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and to get still have access to this type of music through the various channels. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's an uphill struggle. And I don't know if we will get to the other to this day, as I mentioned, we're not getting any support for it. So it is it is a monumental challenge to take on. But we're very committed. We did think about shutting it down one day. And many artists came and they donated themselves. And they said, we don't want this to happen. We even had um, revolution makers, you know, hip hop duo in Gaza. And, you know, it's, it's Gaza, you know, they don't have access to even clean water. And they came and they said, we're going to create a new album and all the sales will come to you because we want to make sure that we can support you. That's how committed the artists are to a platform like Midi Tunes because it has given so many artists so much. We simply can't take that away from them now, you know? I mean, that's amazing. That's incredible. Yeah, I mean, uh, whenever we do get any funding, and let's say it's unrestricted, which is super rare, but even if it's five or 10,000, we would put it towards the projects that would never um, see the light of day otherwise, you know? Um, so Midi Students has been one of those examples where every time there's a donor that comes and gives, you know, 500, 600, um, we would put that immediately to Midi Students, knowing fully well that this is a project that otherwise is not going to Mm -hmm. um, get funded or that the hosting is not going to get covered. Um, so that's really the only way it has been getting funded is small amounts of money here and there, a little bit of crowdfunding, not much, you know, the, only, the biggest amount we've, be, we've been able to reach through crowdfunding with um, Midi Students has been maybe 700, 800, maybe at most 1,200 many years ago. You know, and, and so it has been really difficult because even when you do try to do the crowdfunding route, people see, but this is not a story. This is a platform. You know, when you, for example, are funding or, or fundraising for a specific band, you put a story about that band or you put, you know, and it's easier, but, um, or you funded a specific album. That's a very, you know, output that you, that you can encourage people to give money to, but with MIDI students, they say, but it's already there. So why would I give money to it? What will change? They don't understand the costs that go into maintaining it, redesigning it, making sure it's fully compatible with all the latest browsers, making sure it's secure for both the artist and the users, making sure that people have the capability to go in and create playlists and do all these, you know, embed the music and external websites and do all of these other fun things to it. That takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. But there's just no support. So when we do have support, you can see where it goes. Mm -hmm. The little support that we had, that's the result. You look at Midi Students today with everything that it has, that's that's the result of small donations here and there. You have put your life and your soul into your projects and your work and, and you and have, you know, sort of so much of what you've earned has gone back into these platforms. Um, but you have also built incredible partnerships. And so I would, I'm really interested in right now, the partnerships that are sustaining you, that you're working on, um, you know, outside of these platforms that you've built. And so what kind of support are you getting from the fellows at the Media Lab? Um, I know you're working on a few projects, uh, uh, looking at women's uh, entrepreneurship uh, mm -hmm. and investing. And I'm really curious about that kind of these avenues that you know, you've built these networks and these relationships that have helped to bring you um, platforms to raise money. Um, how is that coming back to you? And, and what is 
where is that inspiration coming from? I'm curious about that because uh, there's constantly inspiration in your head and I, I never really understand how, how you make it into something that feels that you can channel. You know, I have been very fortunate to have been a part of several fellowships that have been very life-changing for me. Shutterworth Foundation, for example, is one of them. Um, TED and the Senior TED Fellowship was one of them. Um, Echoing Green was one of them. Um, Blossom Hill Foundation was one of them. So being a fellow across all of these different um, places has really given me an, you know, renewed hope to kind of keep going because of that partnership and because of that um, bond that many fellows share. That we, when one of us is experiencing major anxiety or an issue, you pick up the phone and you call them and you talk to them and they have a way of kind of making you feel better. And we do the same for them when they're going through, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and some kind of battle, you know, so they've, they've given me a really good system to kind of fall back on, but they've also introduced me to a lot of resources, you know, for example, another um, member, and she's a member of our supervisory board, Astra Taylor, you know, met her at Shutterworth and she connected me to a lot of individual donors, you know, um, and Asuya, um, she's also a Shutterworth Foundation Fellow, and we're collaborating on a new fund, for example, for women in the Global South who want access to um, support for technology and infrastructure and things like that. So these are the types of collaborations that come out of um, knowing people who understand what you're going through, who not just share em empathy and, and you know, are able to sympathize with your situation, but have you know, a really deep understanding about how to tackle them because they themselves were funders or writers or filmmakers and they've been out there. You know, these are um, people who are also very celebrated and they understand what what's kind of what's at stake, you know, when you're building these types of platforms and when you have so many people looking at you for support um, and especially in the region, a lot of people come to Majal and they want to know how we do things and how we build things and they want support to also get off. and. Um, you know, get their projects um, up and running. And so we we, we really knew um, that this was going to be important, even though it's overwhelming sometimes when people come to you and ask for so much support. But knowing myself, and I take myself all the way back to 2004 when I was first starting up, <clears throat> and I didn't have access to these individuals. And when I wrote to people, they never wrote back. And it was so demotivating. And it was so lonely. And I don't want people to feel isolated in their quest for justice or when they're embarking on a, on a creative journey. I want them to know that we're rooting for them. We may not be with them every step of the way because you know we can't take on that type of mentorship for every single person, but we will give them what we what we know. We will unload our knowledge, you know, and we will make sure that, you know, at the end they they have the support that they need to succeed because it is only as a result of these small projects, not the big projects, not the 200 million plus dollar foundations out there. It's a small people, you know, small organizations building um, one at a time. It's not going to be one person who knows the answer to everything, which is a very white man type of approach, you know, that I'm going to raise $80 million because I fixed, I can fix Africa single handedly. These are the types of things that unfortunately still get funded to this day. And I'm very outspoken about these types of things. And by being outspoken about these things, it also means that I don't get access to as much funding because people don't like voices that are seemingly controversial, who maybe would, you know, question philanthropy and how genuine some philanthropic organizations really are. How is it really in their interest to challenge the status quo or are they doing it for the sake of PR, for example? So that's really what I've been standing for for a very long time. So Esther, when you speak, I always, for me, like I've seen this journey and when you said in the beginning, when you said, you know, you needed somebody to have your back and you wanna give somebody your back, like for me that is, you know, you have surmounted the insurmountable, like you've already lived this life of, you know, so many lives combined and you've always been positive and brave and you've never defined success in the way that I've been taught or most of us are taught to define success. You've defined it for yourself and on your own terms. And um, it's obviously like come with its challenges, but equally it allows you to have this clarity and this voice and this courage to speak uh, in a way that very few people uh, in the world do and and i know that doors are going to keep opening because you have done that and so mm -hmm. um 
I wanted to close this by asking you what we ask all of our guests. Um, and it's a difficult question to ask somebody like you who have addressed so many challenges and problems and also had such massive dreams is really what is your radical dream for the future? What is the one thing that is undone, unsaid, uh, or what you're sitting at, the thing that you haven't solved or that you need to see solved? Uh, what would that one thing be? For me, that would be equal opportunity and equal access to justice. And I can say that because I feel that it can manifest itself in many different forms. It could be equal opportunity in education and healthcare um, and, and access to funding and resources, regardless of who you are and where you are. And so that's really what I think at the end of the day, when I look at Majel, that's the one thing that we have continuously stood up for is that equal opportunity and equal access to justice, reimagining what philanthropy and accessibility looks like, decentralized web, you know, for genuine and widespread inclusion, more equitable, knowledgeable and sustainable um, and just future. So these are the things, you know, that that um, keep me going, but it, it is all falls under the one umbrella of at the end, it's about equity and equal access. <laughs>